uh, Nicole said, I'm going to uh, talk to you about some of my research work in pro projection-based model reduction and try to connect it uh, to one of the hottest topics of the moment, which is machine learning or scientific machine learning as it is relevant to us in, in uh, engineering and sciences. Before I start, I just want to mention the uh, members of my research group that have contributed to the, to the work that I'm going to show you. You'll see I'm not going to focus on any one topic. I'm going to hope to give you a bit of an overview of uh, several of the things that we work on. So there are many faces up here. Uh, this is Boris Kramer, uh, one of my current postdocs at MIT, who is about to start a faculty position at uh, University of California. Benjamin Peerstoffer, actually both of these two originated from, from Germany. Uh, Benjamin Peerstoffer, who was a postdoc for many years and is now a faculty member at Courant Institute in New York. This is Laura Manini, who's now at United Technologies. Uh, Michael Kapstein is one of my current PhD students. Victor Singh just defended his thesis last week uh, at MIT. Elizabeth Pian, who uh, is a current PhD student and in fact spent a year here at Aachen uh, in between her bachelor's and graduate work and work with uh, Karen and, Karen and uh, Martin, and Renee Swisschuk, who's a current master's student. And then you'll also see uh, a couple of pieces of work that are collaborations with uh, Aurora Flight Sciences. Corey actually turns out to be one of my past master's students, and then Axelis. Uh, Fur was a postdoc with myself and Tony Patterer, and David was a postdoc with Tony Patterer. So one way or another, uh, all of these folks, I was realizing when I put together the slide, all these folks have come through uh, the group at MIT at some point. And they go out and into the world, but as you well know in academia, you never really leave your PhD or postdoc advisor, um, no matter how hard you try, is that right? <laughs> all right, so. So here are the uh, things that I, I want to uh, get, get through today. I'm going to start off with some motivation, and I'll spend a bit of time uh, showing you several different motivating examples. Again, just to give you a bit of a flavor of some of the, the problems that I work on in my group, but actually more generally to think, especially for the students that are here, what are the really big opportunities and challenges that are on the horizon for us as, as computational scientists and computational engineers? Uh, then we'll just do a really uh, basic primer on a projection framework for model reduction. And then in the main part of the talk in these three, four, and five, I hope to uh, connect to you concepts that we're very familiar with in computational science and engineering, computational mathematics, and uh, hopefully convince you, at least in my way of thinking, of just how relevant those concepts are to machine learning, and then uh, close with some examples of, of applications. So starting off with the motivation and uh, why we need reduced sort of models. So uh, as you heard, I'm uh, trained as an aerospace engineer. My uh, graduate degrees are both in aerospace engineering. And uh, while my work is very much in methods that are motivated by many problems, a lot of the work is motivated by thinking about the next generation of aerospace vehicles. And uh, one of the reasons that I sort of went into this field is because I wanted to be an astronaut when I was little, probably like people here in the, the audience. But I've always uh, thought that aerospace was such an exciting field to be in. And I think today, even more so, it's just an incredibly exciting time. Why is that? Because there are so many changes on those horizon. And those changes relate to new technologies and new ways of using uh, computation that change the very way that aerospace operates and the way it interacts with our lives. So just as some examples, um, unprecedented sensing capabilities. And by the way, I should make a note, I'm going to talk about this in the context of an aerospace vehicle, but everything I say applies to so many applications in engineering and science, whether it's the geosciences or civil infrastructure or uh, other kinds of vehicles. So unprecedented sensing capabilities, um, the ability to collect data about the system that we've never had before, and as just one example, uh, one of the things that we think about, a technology that is uh, already in development and will be becoming available in the next years is uh, something like a sensor skin. So if you can imagine a vehicle, this is a, the blended wing body that I worked on when I was at Boeing, a vehicle like this would have a skin so that while the vehicle was flying, it will be possible to get measurements of, say, pressure and strain field everywhere on the surface of the vehicle as it's flying. And that's very different to today, where we have maybe a couple of sparse uh, strain gauges spread on the wing giving us very noisy measurements. So just think, if you could have that kind of data, if you could have pressure fields, strain fields, 
what would you do with it? How would it change the way you operate the vehicle? How would it change the way you think about designing the vehicle? How would it change the way that you think about designing under uncertainty for environmental conditions if all of a sudden you had sensing uh, capabilities to be able to collect data? Um, and combined with that is now the ability to actually do computations of considerable complexity on board uh, in real time or in near re real time circumstances. So again, these are really game changers. And let me just say it again, this is not just true for aerospace vehicles. This is true for almost every uh, technology that we, that we interact with. Similarly, these vehicles are becoming uh, more interconnected. They can talk to each other. They can talk to other assets on the ground. They can communicate with their uh, larger environment. I'll uh, say a little bit more about the idea of self-awareness in just a second. Uh, we see increasing levels of autonomy. And at the same time, we see uh, so many different demands on performance, reliability, and adaptability, and cost. And again, one really sort of relevant and compelling example is uh, all the interest in urban air mobility, the idea that unmanned vehicles, drones, unmanned uh, aerial vehicles, will sometime in the future be flying around our cities and delivering pizzas and delivering packages and even delivering ourselves as we go to autonomous air taxis. And so if you had asked me a few years ago how far away we were from, from air taxis in, in cities, I would have said decades. Now I'm not so sure. I think that's something that we are going to see very much in our, in our professional lifetimes. So of course, lots of challenges to make that a reality, but a huge opportunity for computational modeling, for data science, uh, for things like machine learning, but physics-based models as well to, to play a role. So putting all those pieces together, the idea that there are new technologies, and in particular, new technologies that are bringing data either through sensors or through simulation capabilities and then uh, a changing space of computational power both on the ground in terms of high performance computing and on board our systems in situ. That really is uh, a complete complete revolution in the world around us and we're already we're already far into that revolution I would say in, in many fields but uh, again so much to do and so much needed in terms of new data-enabled computational science and engineering. And what I'm going to focus on today, a really big, uh, big opportunity for things like reduced order models. So let me show you a few uh, concrete examples to get you thinking about the kinds of problems and uh, the kinds of approaches that we'll be taking to solve these problems. So uh, the first example would be uh, is something in real-time adaptive emergency response. So does anybody recognize, I know Karen and Martin will recognize this domain. Oh, that's okay. so, this, so this is the MIT campus. This is a 3D model of the MIT campus. There's the big dome. This is Killian Court. This is the dome where the students like to do hacks, like they put the police car up on, on top of the dome uh, one day with donuts and warm coffee inside it. And then this jumble of building over here, this is the Stata Center, the Frank Gehry building uh, with its sort of unusual structure. So the, the setup here is that we have MIT campus, uh, we have sensors deployed around campus, fast sensors, and uh, the question is if there was some kind of a contaminant release, let's say from one of the labs on campus, would you be able to uh, collect data from the sensors, solve an inverse problem, saying given the data from the sensors, figure out where the contaminant originated, then uh, given now the initial conditions of this event, solve a forward prediction problem, take the initial uh, condition of the contaminant and predict, given the local uh, wind conditions, where it will go, and then ultimately take some action, such as deciding uh, how to evacuate people or which way to evacuate people. So the question is, could you do all of this? And the answer, of course, is yes. I mean, here is an inverse problem, here is a forward prediction problem, and then here is probably some kind of a decision problem that could be posed as an optimization. But the real question is, could you do all of this fast enough so that you can actually make decisions in time to take action during an event? Because if these things run on the supercomputers and they take weeks to come up with a solution, it's clearly not a useful tool in terms of a real-time uh, adaptive emergency response. So this is a, uh, an older example. You can see here this is a 2013 paper that we worked on where we showed how reduced order models uh, can be used in this setting. But again, keep in mind the sense, infer, predict, and act flow. This is the data to a decision. 
that we're going to see in, in a number of settings. So something completely different. Um, when I'm not thinking about future aerospace vehicles, one of my other passions is education and thinking about how principled mathematical modeling and computation can also be a, a game changer for education. And in fact, education is another example of a field where technologies are completely changing the way that we can start to think about uh, how, how we can think about offering education. So I have another project going on. It's funded by the Department of Education. And in this project, we're working with community colleges in the US, two community colleges. And what we've done is uh, build network models of all the content in, uh, in classes in community colleges. So in this particular example, this is a college algebra class, which is a class that has terrible failure rates. It's a really, really hard class for uh, many of these students to pass. So we build network models that relate all the, at the very micro level, all the skills that the students need to master uh, to solve a particular problem. And then we build sensors. And in this case, the sensors are multi-choice questions with specially designed wrong answers. They're called distractor questions, so that when you get the answer wrong, it helps us to infer what your state of knowledge is. So again, you see now a sense and an infer the state now knowledge of the student. We then can uh, start to use our models to uh, make predictions about what would be useful in terms of helping with the misconceptions and then provide information to the, to the instructors. So again, completely different setting, but this idea of using data to drive decisions with models that help you to predict is, uh, is a common theme. A third example, uh, and this is something that's of uh, great current interest, you may have heard of this concept of a digital twin. So the idea of a digital twin, this is uh, a virtual model of a system. In other words, when uh, we manufacture something like an aircraft, at the same time as we uh, manufacture the aircraft and send it off into the world, we also create a digital twin of that aircraft. And if you could imagine every single one of the aircraft that I've manufactured on a given line, maybe there's a hundred of them, each one of them gets its own digital twin. And you can also imagine that the moment that these aircraft are leaving the manufacturing facility, they're not actually all the same. They're already quite different due to manufacturing variations. So the first thing the digital twin needs to do is reflect those variations. Then as the aircraft go into operation, they see different environmental conditions, so they age, they get damaged at different rates. And again, the idea is that the digital twin will be evolved and follow the vehicles uh, through its life. So again, you can maybe see that the idea of an inverse problem is going to play a really big role here as we can collect information data from the aircraft, we can think about updating the, the, the digital twin. And maybe you can also see that if uh, we had these digital twins, we can start to use them in a predictive sense to make so many decisions about for example, when we do maintenance, how we manage uh, a fleet of vehicles, and, and so on. And I'll come back to this example at the end and show you some of, some of the work that, that we're doing. Then the fourth example, um, something a, a little, little bit different, but related. So this is the idea of a self-aware aerospace vehicle. So uh, I want you to think about those uh, sensor skins that I was talking about, and in this little demo here, I've got a little unmanned vehicle, a UAV, and it's flying uh, through this urban environment. And its goal is to get to the star that's right here in a minimum amount of time. So this is a classic path planning problem. This vehicle knows what it's capable of, and uh, given some partial knowledge about the environment, it can solve an optimization problem to, pa to plan out the path. Uh, in this case, we asked it to, to go with the shortest amount of time. But now I want you to think about the situation on the right where the vehicle is flying and it's flying along here and at this point here it gets damaged. It gets hit by something or something happens to it and it gets damaged. And now the question is, can we use this kind of advanced sensing, something like a sensor skin, to collect data from the wing, to infer the state of damage, to issue predictions now to figure out what the vehicle's flight envelope is, figure out what it's capable of, and then feed that information to a mission planner to take action. And in this particular example, the vehicle was damaged enough so that if I had, if it had tried to take the tight turn around the corner here, it would have exceeded its structural loads uh, in the damaged state, but it was still capable of flying, it just had to take the long way around. 
So again, you see the sense, infer, predict, and act as data to decisions flow, where we've got to collect data, make some inference, solve an inverse problem to make some inference about the system. Then we need models to be able to predict, in this case, to uh, set the new flight envelope for the vehicle, and then to be able to, to do action. And again, you would say we could solve any one of these pieces um, using a supercomputer, but the key is can you make the decision in time so that the vehicle knows whether to take the corner here. If it takes the corner, uh, the sharp corner there, it exceeds structural load and it falls out of, falls out of the sky. So again, um, the, the, the real time or near real time uh, components are really critical in that example. So this is where reduced order models can come in for all of these kinds of problems. Reduce order models, uh, they enable rapid prediction, inversion, design, and uncertainty quantification of uh, large-scale scientific and engineering systems. And how is it that they do it? I'm going to show you mathematically how they do it, but let's first think about philosophically uh, what it is that reduced order models do. And the first point is modeling the data to decision flow. So I keep showing you that piece of sense, infer, predict, and act. And you know, depending on what your background is, maybe you think about the inverse problem, the sense and infer piece, or maybe you think about the forward problem, the predict piece. Well, it turns out that breaking a system like that into pieces often means that the pieces are more complicated than if you were to think about the entire flow as a whole. And why is that? Well, if our goal is to make a decision, let's think about that vehicle, that self-aware vehicle having to make the decision. The decision is how tight of a turner how tight of a corner do I, can I turn? Can I turn the sharp corner, yes or no, or do I take the long way around? I actually don't really care where the damage is. I don't care how deep the damage is, how big it is. What I care about is inferring enough about the damaged state in order to make the right decision. So mathematically, modeling this end-to-end -end flow is going to amount to uncovering low-dimensional structure and the relationship between the data and the decision that we need to, to make. And it's this uh, low dimensional structure that actually lets us come up with reduced order models um, to, to accelerate these tasks. The second theme um, that's going to come through, and I'll mention this, this point several times because I think it's very, very, very important, but there are a lot of people in the world, especially funders, who are very excited about machine learning, and that's great, but we need physics-based models. And why do we need physics-based models? Because uh, in part because we have this predict step sitting in here. And so uh, this, is, this, is, this is something that uh, we, again, as computational scientists, as computational engineering, have a long history of using physics-based models to make predictions about our systems in conditions that we never actually want to get the system in. And again, think about this vehicle. If I'm using, if I'm using some kind of machine learning and I'm learning a model from the data, I don't want to take the vehicle to failure to learn where that failure boundary is. I mean, that's, that's a nonsensical way to think about the problem. I absolutely need the physics-based model to be able to issue predictions about where failure is so that I can make sure that I stay away from it. Now, of course, the data and learning from data is a really valuable part. So figuring out how we exploit the synergies between the physics-based models that let us be predictive, let us uh, uh, issue predictions about places where we have no data or where we have very sparse data, and also learning from the data as well. Uh, the third piece, a principled approximation is to reduce computational cost. So this is a clear motivator for reduced models. Uh, this idea of principled approximation is actually doing it rigorously, sometimes being able to have error bounds or error estimates available to us. And then lastly, to recognize that everything I'm talking about is uh, uncertainty everywhere, and we really have to think about explicitly modeling and treating uncertainty as we, as we go through. So again, that's philosophically how some of the ideas that underlie uh, what we do with reduced order modeling. Let me show you now in just uh, a couple of slides how, how reduced order modeling works mathematically. And the uh, mathematical framework that we're going to use is one that, that takes a projection-based uh, model. So I'm going to start with a large-scale model. And uh, I taught controls for many years at MIT, and so I love to think of things as state-space systems. So I like to show things in this discretized form. But I just want you to imagine that this is your favorite set of PDEs. And you've taken them and you've applied a spatial discretization. So you've applied finite elements or finite difference or finite volume. 
or maybe uh, if you're in uh, chemical engineering or in electrical engineering, you may be starting with a large set of ODEs right from the beginning. So however it is that you got here from discretizing PDEs or just from ODEs, we have this large set of coupled ODEs that we want to solve. This is our, our full order model. On the right here is a general nonlinear model. We have here X, the state, and we have uh, the evolution, the time, time evolution of state X dot is given by some nonlinear function of the state, some parameters P, and some input U. And then we have Y, we have some quantities of interest, uh, the things that we want to be able to predict, probably in support of a decision, which again are nonlinear function in general of the state, the parameters, and some inputs. And there on, here on the left, we have a system that has a little more structure. It's a system that is linear in the state. So now these matrices A, B, and C depend possibly nonlinearly on the parameters P, but they don't depend on the state. So X dot is AX plus BU and Y is equal to CX. So here's an example of a uh, large scale system that's of, of interest. And this is a set of problems that we're trying to get reduced order models to work for, which is the problem of uh, modeling combustion instability. Um, just a little sort of side story. It turns out the US Air Force, oh, actually I'm being videoed, I should be careful what I say, but that's all right. Um, the US Air Force has spent the last couple of decades investing a great deal in uh, computational fluid dynamics, large scale models to model uh, combustion in rocket engines. So now they have the tools, but it takes about three months to run one simulation on supercomputers. And if your real goal is to get these models to then study parameters so that you can understand what a good design choice is so that you uh, can have a stable rocket engine when you actually get to testing, clearly at three months per evaluation, you're not going to be able to study very many configurations. So again, here's a really great opportunity for reduced order models. You don't necessarily need the mo reduced models to be perfect, but you want something much, much faster than three months per evaluation in order to be able to do, uh, to do design studies. So that's, the, that's kind of the background to this project. The, the bad news is this is a really difficult problem for reduced order models, but the good news is that keeps, um, keeps researchers, researchers busy. So back to these large scale models, here's just an example of what those quantities would be in uh, this large scale model. So our state, our x, these are the unknowns, these are the things that we're solving for. And these, these are gonna be things like pressure, velocity, temperatures, concentrations, and remember, these are continuous fields that have been discretized in space over the domain. So the dimension of these unknowns is going to be on the order of the grid you have to put down, which is typically millions. So millions of unknowns. The input parameters, these are the things that I would like to vary as a designer, perhaps, to understand how they affect the uh, system behavior. So things like fuel to oxidizer ratio, uh, maybe combustion zone length, the geometry of the combustor, the fuel temperature, the oxidizer temperature. The U's, the forcing inputs, so these are inputs that vary with time, and these are typically things that come in as boundary conditions. So for example, uh, we'll have boundary conditions on the inlet and the exit of this uh, portion of the combustor that will represent what is going on upstream and downstream in the engine. And then the output quantities of interest, they could be anything. We may want to uh, try to predict the entire flow field or it might be that, for example, when we're trying to uh, characterize instability, typically what's done is that there'll be a, a pressure probe downstream somewhere and we'll be interested in, in computing the, the pressure oscillation at that particular sensor location. So what is it you notice? You notice that there are millions and millions of unknowns and that's what makes the system very big and expensive to solve. But often there are many fewer parameters and inputs and many fewer quantities of interest. And it's that relationships between the inputs and the outputs that we want to exploit when we, we find a reduced order model. So why is it that we think it is possible to take a system like that very complex flow with millions of unknowns and find a low dimensional model that somehow I'm going to claim is a, is a good surrogate? Well, when thinking about whether that's even a good idea, it's always good to go back to the linear case, to go back to the simplest case and ask the question as to whether there is rigorous theory that will guide what goes on. And the answer is yes, there is a rigorous and very beautiful theory in the uh, linear time invariant case. So again, to the students, if you have taken a controls class or a class with state-space modeling, the system should look very familiar. Yes? Yes, yes, that's good. So it's, uh, this should look very familiar. This is a standard uh, linear time invariant system. So x dot is ax plus bu. 
y is equal to cx. And uh, again, these are input states and outputs. And remember, in our setting, x is really big, think a million dimensions. We've got uh, a small number of inputs and a small number of outputs. And so now what we're doing is we're asking the question, is there a lower dimensional model that, ex that maps, that explains or represents the map from inputs to outputs without going through this million dimensional state x? And the answer is often yes. And why is the answer yes? Again, in the linear time in invariant case, is the notion of controllability or reachable reachability, which is to say that if I were to excite the system, if I were to hit the system with an input U, hit it with a hammer, and observe the states, there would be dominant states that pop up. If you want to think of a flow field, there'll be dominant structures, dominant vortical structures uh, that will, will pop up. If you want to think about a beam bending, you'll see the low frequency modes, and as the frequency gets higher, you see less and less of the modes, right? You've seen this idea in many settings. So the idea is that there are some modes that are easy to get into, and there are some modes that are hard to get into. And in fact, there's something called the good controllability Gramian matrix, which is a matrix that depends on A and B, on these matrices, that whose eigenmodes tell us exactly the eigenvector with the biggest eigenvalue is the state that's easiest to reach, and then so on down. So uh, this, this uh, Gramian matrix, and in particular, its eigenvectors tell us exactly just how reachable a state is. On the uh, other side, there's a dual concept, observability, which says once I'm in a particular state, just how important is it for generating output? And again, the observability Gramian matrix, which uh, is a function of C and A, uh, its eigenmodes will tell us how observable a state is. So in model reduction, we're after a low dimensional model that represents the mapping from inputs to outputs. And so again, just sort of conceptually, it means if a state is really, really hard to get into, i.e. we're just not gonna get into that state, we don't care about it. And if a state, once we get into, doesn't generate any output, we also don't care about it. And so what we're after is this product of states that are easy to get into and are important from, from, the, uh, from the point of view of the output. And I presented this very informally, but it turns out that there's very rigorous theory that goes all with all of this, with the concept of Hunkel singular values, again, in the linear time invariant case. Uh, but the reason I put this up here is just to point out that there really is very sort of good reason for us to believe that low dimensional structure exists in, in uh, many, of, many of these systems. Okay, but uh, linear time invariant case is not unfortunately going to uh, represent most of the problems we're interested in. So we need a more general way of approaching the problem of finding these reduced models. And that's where the uh, projection framework comes into play. So again, let's think about the full order model, the general system. I'm going to write here the one that's linear in state. I've put the param parametric dependence back in. And uh, what we say now is that we believe that the high dimensional state x, the million dimensional uh, vector x, can be represented with many fewer degrees of freedom. And I'm going to write that as an expansion and a basis. So V here is the tall, skinny basis matrix. Its columns are basis vectors, and I'm going to have uh, little n basis vectors, v1, v2, up to v little n. And now x reduced, the reduced order state, will be the coefficients of expansion in that basis. So I can substitute this approximation into these equations. Now I have millions of equations, but I have just, let's say, 100 degrees of freedom. So in general, I'll have a residual. I won't be able to satisfy this equation exactly. And then we use a standard uh, Galerkin projection, or here a petrov Galerkin projection, which says, define another basis, W, uh, and enforce this condition, W transpose R equals zero. The residual is orthogonal to the space spanned by the, col the columns of W. And when you do that, you get the reduced model. And what do you notice? The reduced model has the same structure as the full model, X dot equal AX plus VU. But now, instead of having the million dimensional state X as its unknowns, it has these reduced order states, X reduced. These are no longer physical quantities. Remember, these were things like discretized pressure. These things are modal coefficients. And the uh, A reduced, B reduced, and the C reduced are nothing but the projections of the original big A, B, and C onto the subspaces defined by the basis matrices V and W. So uh, in the linear case, it's sort of very easy to see. It's a very simple idea but it's a very powerful idea. Find a low dimensional subspace, here a linear subspace, 
take the governing equations, represent the solution in that subspace, and then project the governing equation till you get a, a, a reduced order model. So uh, one thing I want to point out, because I'll come back to this, is that this projection framework preserves the structure of the uh, model. And you've seen it here for the linear case. Uh, here I'm going to put in a math matrix, uh, an E, a, or uh, yeah, a math matrix or a descriptor matrix here, E, um, on the left-hand side. And when we do the projection, we get the same, we preserve the structure of the model. And why is that important? It's important for a number of reasons. But remember, where does the structure of the model come from? It comes from the physics. Right? When you see something like AX, a linear term, it's probably a diffusion operator or a convection operator, right? an advection operator. So the structure of these models, I'm writing them in discretized form. But remember, these represent the physics. They represent the governing equation. And I showed you the linear equation. It turns out um, if we had a quadratic equation, so now EX dot equals AX plus BU plus HX cross X, H here is a tensor, and these are all the quadratic products of the state X. When you apply projection to this system, uh, and here I should say I'm using Galerkin projection, so I've made W equal V. When we apply projection to this system, it also preserves the structure. We get a reduced order model with the uh, same quadratic structure, and this H hat, this reduced H now is V transpose H of V cross V. It's a little bit more complicated, but the structure is preserved. And maybe you could see that if I added a cubic and a fourth order, if I kept going with this polynomial structure, I would have to deal with high order tensors, but the projection framework preserves the structure of the system. And again, I'm going to come, come back to that in a second. All right, so we've seen, um, we've seen the general idea of uh, projection-based model reduction, but now you're thinking, oh, well, how do you compute V? How do you compute W? How do you come up with error estimators? What about the nonlinear system? You've probably got lots of questions, and I'm not going to answer most of those questions in this lecture, but the good news is for most of those questions, you can go and find uh, lots of solutions in the literature as well as open, open problems. But let me just say in terms of how do you compute the basis, the answer is lots of ways, lots of different methods that have come up from different fields. And as you can imagine, uh, different methods maybe are well suited to, uh, to different types of problems. I co-authored with Peter Benner and Sikhan Goezhin. I co-authored co co a um, sign review paper a few years ago. This is probably not a bad place to start for an overview because there are lots and lots of references in this paper. Um, and these, these methods are, uh, these first three especially are, are all discussed. And then you have two, uh, two experts on, or at least two experts on reduced basis method here in the Athens faculty as well. So let me uh, just talk very briefly about one of the methods that's used to compute the basis. It's the most commonly used method. It's also the simplest. It's the POD, the proper orthogonal decomposition, which is more or less the same thing as PCA, principal components analysis, uh, in the weather community, they call it EOF, empirical orthogonal eigenfunctions. And at the heart of all these methods is FCD to find a low-dimensional subspace. So how does POD work? POD says uh, run your high-fidelity simulation, this big model that we're trying to approximate. Run it for some situations, some scenarios that are of interest, and collect the solutions. And these solutions are called snapshots. So snapshots are solutions of the big model maybe at different times, or maybe you're trying different parameter values, or maybe both. Take those snapshots and snack, stack them up as columns in what's called the snapshot matrix. And then the POD basis is nothing but the left singular vectors of the snapshot matrix that correspond to the biggest singular values. And why is that maybe a sensible thing to do? Because SVD theory tells us but if I have these uh, snapshots, I have k snapshots, and I want to represent them in a, in a uh, what do we have, little n-dimensional linear subspace, the best I can do in an L2 sense, the least, the least squares, uh, the, the, the minimum L2 error is given by the left singular, singular vectors. And in fact, I know that the error in representing those snapshots in the and the reduced space is given by the sum of the squares of the singular values that I don't see. So of course, this is an optimal representation of the snapshots. It doesn't tell us anything about how good the reduced model will be. But in terms of representing the snapshots, um, this is a, at least a, a reasonable thing to do. And <coughs> again, it's a relatively simple idea. It turns out that POD 
she works surprisingly well for a very, very large class of problems, uh, although, although not all. Okay, so let's get to this question of uh, what's the connection between um, what's the connection between reduced order modeling and uh, and and machine learning. So when you have questions like this, where do you go? You go to Google, right? And what up, what pops usually is a Wikipedia page. So uh, machine learning is a field of computer science that uses statistical techniques to give computer systems the ability to learn with data without being explicitly programmed. And reduced order modeling also has a Wikipedia entry. Re model order reduction is a technique for reducing the computational complexity of mathematical models and numerical simulations. So when you read those, you think, well, there's no connection. These are very different things. So this is a quote from uh, one of my papers from uh, last year. Um, and I firmly believe this, that the difference in fields is really, I think, largely one of history and perspective. That model reduction methods have come from the computational science, scientific computing, community where we start with a high dimensional model, which by the way comes from the physics, and the focus is on reducing it. You see here, reducing the complexity um, of the model. We start with a model that we believe and then we try to reduce it to find a low dimensional model. Whereas uh, machine learning has come from computer science where you start with a pile of data and you try to learn a low dimensional model that explains that data. But really, uh, and we've seen more and more in recent years, First of all, the methods that sit inside these two uh, have a lot of commonality. So we already saw POD and PCA are basically the same thing. So the notion of SVD. Uh, and even beyond that, some of the nonlinear manifold methods. So a lot of the methods are the same. And what's more, if you go back to all my motivating examples, you'll see that these are situations where there's data that we can use to learn in our systems, but there's also a need for the physics so that we can be predictive. And so trying to blend these two perspectives, um, I think, is really important. There's already some work in that area, but is even, even more, um, more important for the, for the future. So that sort of gets us to this uh, idea of projection-based model reduction uh, giving us a way to think about formulations for scientific machine learning. And maybe I should say the scientific machine learning phrase, this is a phrase that uh, is floating around in the US right now. It's sort of being coined by the Department of Energy who had a uh, large working group on scientific machine learning that I was a part of that released a report uh, just a, a few months ago. But it really is you know, asking the question of how do we, uh, how do we use machine learning uh, in applications in science and engineering where if the machine learning algorithm gets a wrong recommendation on what movie you're gonna watch, the consequences are not nearly the same as uh, managing a nuclear stockpile or making, designing an airplane that people are going to fly on. So how do we use machine learning to help us do better with our modeling, but appreciating that in science and engineering we're really making critical decisions where we need models that are interpretable, that we can analyze, that we have some notion of convergence, that we can make guarantees, and as I said before, models that we can use to make predictions in places where we actually may not have, have data. Um, so I think the report started to at least touch on some of the, the questions there. So if I uh, have time to get all three, I, through all three, I want to touch on three ideas um, that I hope will convince you that the model reduction community, which again comes from computational science, from computational math, with a lot of rigorous notions of convergence um, and approximation theory, that there are at least these three ideas that come from the model reduction community that are all make it very, very relevant to the learning from data setting. So the first is to show you that reduced models can in fact be learned from data. Um, that second, that basis expansions actually give us a way to respect physical constraints, which is a big question that people always put in front of machine learning. How do you make a neural net respect physical constraints? And that fine, uh, finally, structure can be exposed through variable transformation. Um, I may skip over the second one. Actually, what time did you want me to stop talking? Sorry, just one second. Well, I'll keep talking. You can tell me when you can stop talking. But again, um, a big part of this is getting towards models that are domain aware, which is, uh, again, Department of Energy language. This means physics, know about the physics, that are interpretable and that are, are analyzable. So the first point that uh, reduced order models can be learned from data. So I showed you the projection framework, and I didn't, uh, I didn't give you all, I mean, I gave you the one uh, 
PowerPoint version of it, but just to appreciate that there's a lot of analysis that can go along with that projection framework. And in fact, there are large classes of systems for which you can do the projections, base reduced models, and then actually derive error estimators to have some rigorous notion of how good the reduced model is. Well, it turns out um, there is actually a way in some settings to learn the reduced models from data, but to recover the models that you would have gotten to uh, through projection. And so, again, I'm not going to go into details, but I hope to, um, to, to give you enough of a hint so you get the ideas. I just want to remind you of this slide where we saw that a projection framework uh, preserves the structure of the model. And so what does this mean? It means that this projection framework gives us a mathematical lens through which to learn physics-based low dimensional models from data. I'm going to step you through the, the ideas of the algorithm, but just to give you the sort of the thought about where we're going, the idea is I'm going to generate data from this system. This is the full model, this is somehow reality. I'm going to generate uh, snapshot data from this system, but I'm going to try to learn a low dimensional model. And what the projection framework tells me is that the low dimensional model that I try to learn should have this structure because projection preserves the structure. And so how is it uh, we could go about doing that? This is the operator inference work that uh, Benjamin Pierstoffer worked on when he's in my group. So we're going to generate full state trajectories. Again, think about running your expensive combustion code. So here are our snapshots stacked up in the snapshot matrix. And we're also going to need, uh, this is sometimes called the velocity data, the snapshots of the x dot as well. Now we're going to compute the POD basis, and remember to do that, we just take the snapshots and we put them in the snapshot matrix and compute the, singular val uh, the left singular vectors, so that's, that's fine. Now I'm going to take the snapshots, here's the snapshot matrix X, and I'm going to project it onto the POD basis, C transpose X. So what is X hat? X hat now are snapshots of those POD modal coefficients. They're telling me, snapshot one, here's how it looks in that POD basis. Snapshot two, here's how it looks in that POD basis. So what do I have now? I actually have, and by the way, I could do the same thing for X dot. I actually have now data that looks like it came from a reduced model. I don't have a reduced model yet, but I've actually constructed a data set that looks like it came from a reduced model. So now I can find, I can now pose an optimization problem that says, find me the reduced model, find me the low dimensional model that created or could have created that data. And uh, I know the form of that model. It's, uh, again, got this polynomial structure. And what is this expression here? This is nothing but the residual. You see here is E x dot equals A x plus H x cross x plus B u. So this is just the residual. Take the snapshot data in the reduced uh, POD basis, plug it in, minimize the residual, find me the reduced model, find me the A hat, the B hat, the E hat, and the H hat that best, uh, that minimizes that residual. So it turns out this least squares problem has lots of structure. Uh, it's actually very easy to solve. It actually even breaks apart. Um, and what's really particularly nice about it is that under certain conditions, idealized conditions with no noise and a certain uh, condition on the rank, of the basis and how the basis grows, you can actually recover, show that you can recover the intrusive POD reduced model. So why is that important? Because the intrusive model, the one that I went through, the V transpose AV, is the one where we can do analysis. We can have, we can often, not always, but often derive error estimators. So now we have a way, because nowhere here did I need A, right? I didn't need A, I didn't need to go and do the projections, but now we have a way uh, to learn the reduced model directly from data, just from outputs of the model, but in a setting where we have some notion of, of rigor. And uh, by the way, I didn't say this, but I think this is the other reason that machine learning is so popular, because it's so easy to use, right? You don't even have, you don't have to know what a derivative is. You don't even have to really know what SVD is. You can just push the button. You can give the data and you can push the button. That convenience of black box learning is, is huge. But now we get the rigor of projection-based uh, reduction and the structure imposed by the, by the physics. So uh, that's the, the first idea, which is uh, the projection-based framework is powerful, but it's kind of clunky. It's designed by mathematicians, for mathematicians. Um, we, can learn, we can learn those models. Uh, the second one I'm going to go through, because I think I'm a little short on time, but this is the idea that uh, there is actually ways to, uh, ways to impose structure through the way that you actually do the basis expansion with uh, things that are often called particular solutions or uh, static static corrections. 
But let me not talk about this because I do want to talk about this last piece, which is uh, of lifting. Because so far you might be sitting there thinking that I started off talking about combustion and reacting flow, but then I keep showing linear and quadratic systems. And you're thinking, well, the real world's not really governed by quadratic dynamical systems. So this last piece, this idea of lifting, this is a relatively new work, which uh, I'm very excited about and I think is a really powerful set of ideas if we can figure out how to harness them, which is that we shouldn't just take the problem that's given to us in the textbook, but we should actually really be thinking about what the physics are telling us and exposing structure through variable transformations. So let me show you a couple of examples that are hopefully uh, familiar. So here are the Euler, ex the Euler equation. So uh, compressible inviscid flow. And you already know that you can write the uh, Euler equations in either, with either conservative variables, density, momentum, and energy, or the primitive variables, density, velocity, and pressure. Right? You know you can write them in either way. It's something you see in the textbook. Um, and then you also know that these are horribly nonlinear equations. It doesn't look quite so bad here, but you've got the equation of state, and so this thing is a real kind of mess and it's hard to solve. Um, so you may or may not have been taught this in fluids class, but if you uh, define the specific volume, Q, which is one over density, and now apply the chain rule, so let's write down an evolution equation for Q, for one over density, and put that in, well then it turns out that if we work in velocity, pressure, and Q, specific volume, the Euler equations are exactly quadratic in those states. So what do we do as computational scientists? We work with these guys. Why? Because that's what the codes are written in. But uh, if we're thinking about creating reduced models, these are the physical variables that reveal the quadratic structure that, by the way, we can now learn reduced models for from, from, from data, so lifted variables. So that's an example that maybe is somewhat familiar. Let me show you another example that's maybe a little bit surprising. So. We have this, this is a model problem that we use for our combustion um, research because it's simple but it's complicated and it has a lot of the behavior, it has a limit cycle oscillation behavior. So there are two physical states here, the species con concentration and the temperature. So here's a diffusion term, so this is a spatial derivative, here's a diffusion term with a Peclet number, here's advection, linear advection, and then here are the nonlinear terms. These are the reaction, sort of Arrhenius type reactions. So we've got concentration e to the gamma is a uh, constant minus gamma over temperature. So you've got state e to the something, something over state. So just look, if you look at that and you think that's not, certainly not linear, not quadratic. So now you can start playing this game of lifting transformations. In the Euler case, we uh, just change the variable. In this case, we're going to introduce new variables, auxiliary variables. So we're going to introduce W1, which is e to the gamma minus gamma over temperature. W2 is 1 over temperature squared. W3 is 1 over temperature. So now we need evolution equations for each one of these, and you just apply the chain rule right, and derive evolution equations. Well, really interestingly, already the dynamics for these auxiliary variables are quartic and the original equations become quadratic. So now instead of having these one, two nonlinear equations, we could have one, two, three, four, five equations that would be quartic. And again, think back to that slide where I showed the structure, a, a projection-based reduced model of a quartic system is a quartic reduced model. So already you could go looking for quartic reduced models if you wanted to deal with the, the tensors. Or you can keep going and introduce these additional three auxiliary variables, which are quadratic pairs of the, the last ones. And then actually what you find is you can get the system into quadratic by linear form, meaning that the only uh, terms that show up are at most quadratic pairs of the state. So now I've got one, two, the original two, and then one, two, three, four, five, six original states, and I only at most have quadratic pairs. The downside is uh, we have differential algebraic equations, and we have these algebraic equations, but again, just to, um, just to kind of put things in a nutshell, we could either work with these or we could work with these. Now, if your goal was to create a simulator of the system, you would never go ahead and do this. But we are not going to try to discretize these equations. What we're doing is we're manipulating these with a pencil and a piece of paper, and it's telling us if you were to work with these states, then the reduced order model that you would look for would have this uh, quadratic bilinear form. And again, just to remind you, the projection-based framework will preserve the structure. 
and you're going to see in a second, what we're going to do is we're going to generate data from this system. We now have these lifting transformations. I can take the snapshot data from the system. I can transform it. I can project it onto the basis. I've got now reduced order information that looks like it came from a reduced model of the system. And then I can solve an optimization problem to find E hat, A hat, B hat, H hat, and N hat. And I have a, have a, have a reduced model. And so that's kind of all the, the pieces that go together. Um, just a couple quick plots here to show you that this is not an entirely crazy idea. So here's a quadratic bilinear POD reduced model that again preserves its structure. And uh, uh, the two plots here are showing the quantity of interest here is the uh, temperature at the right hand of the domain as a function of time. These are two different dam collar numbers. So this is a parameter that controls whether uh, the, the tubular reactor settles to a steady state or whether it enters into a limit cycle. And you can see the full order model in blue and then this reduced order model in, in, uh, in red. So you can see that the reduced order model actually captures the behavior uh, fairly, fairly well. Okay, so uh, just really, really quickly to uh, close up, let me just show you one last example um, that's, that's pretty cool. This is back to um, this idea of a self-aware UAV. Um, so this is a project that's been going on for some time at the Air Force. Uh, with the Air Force funding. And over the years, uh, we have been modeling this vehicle at different scales with different fidelities. And again, if there are engineers here, you full know, and in fact, even uh, those of you who work in sciences, you full know th this, uh, this trade-off, right? If you want a high fidelity model, you can only model a little bit of the system. In other words, if you want a really detailed finite element model, you can do one panel. If you want to model the whole vehicle, you've got to go to your simplified models because you just can't do the super high fidelity models at scale. Well, this is where reduced order modeling comes in. But the reduced order modeling actually is what lets us get both fidelity and scale. And so what we're, what, and what I'm going to show you on the next slide is that we're using the reduced order model to get the kind of accuracy we can get with the detailed CFD and finite element models, but with orders of magnitude speed up, which means we can go to the full, uh, the full vehicle. So here's just kind of a snapshot of the model of the wing of our vehicle, um, just so you can see some of the components. We model the skin, we model the, uh, this is the structural components, the spar and the ribs, um, the flaps, there's all kinds of bits and pieces. Here's kind of the key takeaway that one finite element solve takes about a minute, and a reduced basis solve takes fractions of seconds, so you get about three orders of magnitude speed up. And, uh, we're working with Excellus, which is a, a small startup that's, that's come out of MIT, and we're using uh, what they call the Integra platform that lets us do a structural model with this reduced basis technology for the whole vehicle. And uh, again, just to leave you with a thought of something that I think is, is really important, um, and what I've talked about with creating this basis, maybe you've noticed there's a lot of sampling that goes on. We have to create those snapshots, right? We have to somehow cover the space of interest. The more parameters you have in the problem, the harder it is for you to sample the space. Just think about the cursive dimensionality. So uh, I think a really important area of future research and something that's enabling us to do this full vehicle is this idea of a component-based reduced basis approach. What does that mean? That means that we take the vehicle and we break it up into chunks. We break it up into these components and we build a reduced order model for each component separately. And why is that important? Well, because each one of these uh, parts of the wing, we want to be able to represent the local structural properties so we can model the damage. But if we take the whole vehicle, we're going to have hundreds and hundreds of parameters, and I need to now try and build a reduced model for the whole piece. It's just not tractable. So instead, we break it up. Now I think about just this component of the wing, just this piece. I parameterize it by its local damage parameters. I also have to parameterize it by its boundary conditions that let it plug in to, uh, to other pieces. So you can, in a way, almost think about these things like Lego blocks. Now I've got little reduced models that I can think about putting together with the other pieces of, of the system. So this idea of domain decomposition or a component-based approach that breaks a complex system up into a lot of pieces and then puts it together in the right way, I think is a really, really important part of overcoming uh, cursive dimensionality for parameters. So what's exciting and also scary about this project is that we're actually building the vehicle uh, together with Aurora Flight Sciences. And in fact, the vehicle flew for the first time last week. It also crashed for the first time last week. We 
because, not because there's anything wrong with the vehicle, but because one of the wheels came off on takeoff. And so then once you're up in the air and you've only got one wheel, um, turns out it's very difficult to land. And so it had a bit of a tumble, but it's getting repaired. So uh, we'll be doing flight tests on this vehicle over the, um, over the coming weeks and uh, hopefully showing how these, this idea with these reduced order models can be used. Uh, actually, it turns out it got damaged by itself. We have uh, damaged wings that we can pop in and out. And it turns out it's damaged by itself anyway, but show how reduced order models can sort of show this real-time decision-making to help an airplane uh, and autonomous navigation. So uh, just to conclude, I'm sorry I um, run a little long. I think the introductions were too long. You guys did some amazing stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a very exciting time to be an engineer and also to be a computational scientist, computational mathematician, computational engineer, um, especially because of this abundant sensor data and then this idea of, ed of edge computing, computing in the field, computing in situ. Um, and of course, many people are very excited about machine learning and that's great and we as computational scientists should be embracing that. But let's not forget that physics-based models have structure. Those physics-based models are what let us predict, let us fill in the gaps when we have sparse data, let us predict conditions that we haven't seen, that we don't want our systems to get into. And so our learned models need to exploit and res respect that structure and uh, I've shown you just one way to think about that problem, but the idea of projection, which has got such a long history of mathematics in our community, is one way to think about a structure, structure preserving lens. And uh, so I talked about these few, these three pieces, the idea of learning a reduced model directly from data, the idea of transformations, and then I didn't actually talk about this part of particular solutions. But there are lots and lots and lots of open questions. Uh, everything, when the system is nonlinear becomes a challenge and we definitely need better ways of finding low dimensional manifolds, uh, of handling nonlinear terms, of thinking about how we use adaptivity, data driven methods. Multi-scale problems are a huge challenge. And I talked to some of the students today who are working in these areas. Uh, so really thinking about how we get reduced sort of models that go across multiple, multiple scales. Um, I talked about, I emphasized the rigor but I hope I also gave you the caveat that that rigor only applies to certain classes of problems, and especially in nonlinear problems, the guarantees start to go away. So then the question is, what do we do? Um, the idea that the models are all inadequate and how we handle that uncertainty. And then this last point, um, I think we, the computational science and engineering community, need to kind of get with the game a little bit and recognize that, as I said, one of the reasons machine learning is so exciting is because it's easy to use and the barrier of adoption for so many of our methods, especially in model reduction, has been so high that it's no wonder that engineers in Boeing didn't pick up you know, 10 papers from science journals to wade through to figure out how to do projections. So making our, our methods more accessible while retaining their rigor, I think is something that's uh, really, really important. With that, um, I will thank the sponsors and then I'll pop this up. So if anything I've talked about is interest to you, you can uh, find most of the papers at uh, Kiwi that's moved to ISIS, that's no longer ISIS, we're now the Odin Institute, it'll be kiwi.odin.utex.edu soon, but for now it's just there. So with that, thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions.